Good morning and welcome to our Jobs Outlook. My name is Chris Konetsky. I'm the president of Business Publications Corporation. As Iowa navigates the final quarter of 2024, the state's unemployment rate remains low. But of course, workforce challenges persist. I'm not sure that I go to any event right now where we're talking about challenges and workforce doesn't become part of that equation. We've been seeing uh, a shrinking of labor pools, but there's been layoffs in the ag manufacturing. There's also, of course, a struggle and a challenge to retain and attract college grads. At the same time, our community and our economy continues to grow. Inflation is calming, and many employees are continuing to evaluate and navigate a more flexible hybrid workplace. Our senior staff writer, Kathy Bolton, has curated a fantastic lineup of panelists today that are going to help us peer a little bit into the future to see what the jobs outlook is going to be in 2025 and beyond. We've got a great discussion ahead, and it's only possible because of the support we receive from our sponsors. So first, I'd like to thank today's supporting sponsor, Iowa Economic Development Authority. IEDA is dedicated to strengthening the state's economic and community vitality by building partnerships and leveraging resources to position Iowa as a top choice for businesses and people. IEDA invests in initiatives that drive business growth, attract and retain skilled talent, and promote community revitalization. You can learn a little bit more about IEDA at Iowa. Uh, iowaeda.com, or you can hear from our uh, from the executive director, Debbie Durham, at our Envision Iowa event that's coming up next week on Tuesday, October 22nd. That's going to be at the Hilton Inn in West Des Moines. In West Des Moines. Uh, if you don't have a ticket for that, I'd recommend getting one right now. The conversation is going to be great. We're going to be talking about a lot of the topics that we're talking about today at kind of a ma macro state level. Uh, the things and the drivers that are leading to the economic development for the state, we're going to be exploring some of those things. Uh, if you enjoyed today's discussion, you're going to enjoy that event on Tuesday. Plus, it'll be a great opportunity to hear from Debbie and connect with leaders from across the state. Next, I'd like to introduce our 2024 Denton's Davis Brown Human Resource Professional of the Year Award. HR professionals play a vital role to ensuring organizations have the right people, skills, and resources to succeed. And since 2020, Denton's Davis Brown has proudly sponsored this award, helping to elevate an exceptional HR leader from Central Iowa who is recognized not only for their achievements with their company, but also for their contributions to the HR profession and the community. Joining us today is Ann Kendall, so the special counsel at Denton's Davis Brown. She's going to tell us a little bit more about Denton's, and then she's going to recognize the 2024 Professional of the Year. Welcome, Ann. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. As Chris said, my name is Ann Kendall, Kendall, and I'm an employment lawyer at Denton's Davis Brown. As someone who works closely with HR professionals every day, I witness firsthand the incredible impact they have, not only in the lives of every employee, but across nearly every facet of the business. HR professionals are involved in hiring, pay, benefits, employee relations, compliance, communications, and policies, and that's just the start. Uh, their responsibilities continue to grow, especially within industries like insurance. At Denton's, we understand that attracting, retaining, and managing your workforce is critical to achieving your business goals. Our employment team is renowned for offering creative, business-savvy counseling, and when needed, our results-driven litigation practice consistently delivers success. We work hand-in-hand -hand with HR professionals and the C-suite serving as day-to-day -day legal advisors and supporting human resources teams at every stage of the employment process, from initial hiring to difficult termination situations. Denton's is with you in the boardroom, helping strategize cutting edge employment policies and corporate, corporate compliance programs. We draft policies, contracts, conduct internal corporate investigations, provide training, and offer counsel during mergers and acquisitions, reductions in force, restructuring, and other critical business activities. We're also with you at the negotiation table, providing counsel and representation in traditional labor matters, negotiating collective bargaining agreements, and assisting in all union-related issues. And of course, Denton's is there for you in the courtroom, where we bring extensive experience litigating employment-related claims, from allegations of discrimination and retaliation to wage disputes, breach of contract, and more. We have you covered. Through our work, our admiration for HR professionals grows every day. They regularly face unexpected challenges, tight deadlines, and tough personalities, all while managing to still accomplish what they actually planned to do that day. I'd like to give a special shout out to our own HR director, Katie Yohi, who constantly pivots behind the scenes to make it all happen. Now, the reason I'm here today, I'm especially proud to recognize Jeff Votes of Grinnell Mutual as the 2024 Denton's Davis Brown Human Resources Professional of the Year. 
I have had the pleasure of knowing Jeff for more than 10 years. I met him while he was working at one of the companies I represent as outside employment counsel. Right away, I appreciated Jeff's energy <clears throat> and his desire to do things the right way from a compliance and a human standpoint. Today, Jeff is Vice President of Human Resources, Talent Development, and Business Excellence of Grinnell Mutual. Now, when introducing someone for a professional honor such as this, it's easy to fall back on the laundry list of their accomplishments, uh, their time at the company, recognitions earned, volunteer activities, and the like. And we could certainly do that with Jeff if we had the time. Uh, he's had a long career in the field, including eight years at Grinnell Mutual, and he has given back so much to his community. But in this instance, let's hear what others have to say about Jeff. Jeff's nomination came from Nicole Smith, Assistant Vice President of Benefits at Grinnell Mutual, who reports directly to him. As his direct report, Jeff guides us to do what is right, be transparent with all appropriate parties, and work toward the best interest of our employees. If we do this, it will all fall into place. This sets the precedent on how we manage our departments. I feel so fortunate to be led by a leader like Jeff. Over the last eight years of working with him, I have not only grown in my career, but I've also grown as a person. Another of his employees, Jeff Nauman, who's only worked for Jeff Votes for a short time, wrote, he is the leader that people want to work for. He is respectful, knowledgeable, and allows his team to feel empowered in their daily projects. He is comfortable in all settings and has no problem cracking bad dad jokes at himself. And it's not only his employees who sing his praises. Jeff Mennery, CEO of Grinnell Mutual wrote, in my 45 year career with Grinnell Mutual, I have not encountered a human resources leader who has achieved as much as Jeff Votes. His contributions have been instrumental in upholding our core values, being employee focused, promoting teamwork, accountability, continuous improvement and forward thinking. His unique ability to embrace challenges and implement effective solutions makes him an invaluable asset to our organization. And of course, above all of Jeff's professional accomplishments, nothing compares to his commitment to his family. He and his wife, Bethany, have four daughters, Heidi, Lauren, Hannah, and Lily. Denton's Davis Brown, in conjunction with the business record, <clears throat> is proud to recognize Jeff Votes as the 2024 Human Resources Professional of the Year. Congratulations, Jeff. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Denton Davis Brown, and thank you, Business Record, uh, for this acknowledgement. Uh, it's an honor to receive this award, and uh, I just couldn't be more honored. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. We appreciate it, and and thank you for everything you've done, uh, not only for your company, of course, but for your accomplishments in the field and helping be a leader and an example for, for companies all across the, the community. Uh, I know you appreciate it. You'll have an opportunity um, where our team will be writing about Jeff and you'll have an opportunity to learn a little bit more about him and the jobs issue that comes out in November. So we'll be excited to, to learn and, and read more about you in the coming weeks. All right. Uh, we've got just under an hour here. We will barely be able to scratch the topic uh, and be able to solve everybody's job challenges here in the next uh, 50 minutes. But our hope here is to help send you down the right path, and we've got the right people to help you do that. Kathy Bolton's our senior staff writer. She's been writing about workforce development for a number of years. She's also written about real estate and development. She's been very well entwined into the challenges that organizations are facing. She's put together a great panel for you. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her. She's going to guide you through the rest of the afternoon. Kathy? Thanks, Chris. Um, and thank you, panelists, for being here today. Let me introduce you. First, we have Kathy Anderson, who's division administrator, um, a division administrator for Iowa Workforce Development, Samantha Grork, executive, executive director for the Central Iowa Building and Construction Trades Council, Amner Martinez, founder and CEO of Infinite Resources, Joyce McDaniel, Vice President of Human Resources at Unity Point Health, Melissa Ness, CEO and President of Connectify HR, and Tom Root, Associate Pres Professor of Finance at Drake University. Um, so thank you all for joining us. We're gonna dive right in. 
During our jobs outlook discussion a year ago, panelists were asked to predict challenges employers would face in 2024. They said employers would continue to they said it would continue to be challenging for employers to find employees to fill open jobs and searches for workers would need to be widened. They also said there would be likely be more friction between workers who want to work that hybrid schedule and employers who prefer employees be in the office more or even in the office full time. So Melissa, let's go to you first. What do you see as the top hiring challenges for employers going into 2025 and are those challenges alike or different from a year ago? Thanks, Kathy, and thanks to you and the entire business record team for having us all together and letting me be a part of it. I think they did a good job of predicting those last year. So I first want to say that. And in terms of top hiring challenges, we continue to see uh, within several industries and functions, the talent shortages as um, a as magnified by the skills gap that we all are continuing to hear and talk about. And I do think that is widening from even last year at this time, um, just given the setting that we all find ourselves in. We continue to see employees want to have greater flexibility and where and when and how they work. Uh, and so we, we can see some of that conflict happening there. Um, we see employers asking us and those that we serve uh, about wages and benefits. How do I continue to contribute to uh, benefits? What type of benefits? What's market look like on benefits? We're getting more questions than ever about some of those things just to continue to help them with their hiring challenges to attract in uh, better talent, more skilled talent into their workforce. Melissa, can you dive in a little more about the benefits portion? What, what are employers, are they adding new things? What, what are they doing to, yeah. to sweeten that pot? Yeah, great question. We see more contribution to medical, but even more than that in ancillary benefits. So con contributing more to dental, contributing more on a short-term disability plan, paying for that for their employees, paying for a basic life product for their employees, um, contributing to or paying for LTD long-term disability. So really kind of enhancing some of those, what we call ancillary benefits in addition to uh, taking a look at medical contributions. How about contributions to child care? Are we seeing any of that occurring? You know, not in the small to medium-sized businesses that we serve. I'm not seeing that a lot. There's a lot of conversations around that, which really get more into flexibility. That's more what we hear getting talked about is flexibility um, around those things and around schedules. Great. Thank you. And our same question to you. What, what are you seeing as the top hiring challenges for employers in 2025? Um, thank you. Um, so the unemployment is 2.8%. Um, typically, my old boss and I, he, he would tell me, you got to cut that in half, you know, um, due to work ethics and um, not enough skills or, you know, screenings, they don't meet the minimum requirements. So everybody essentially is fighting for that, the real pool of unemployed people are at 1.4%. So it's really, really low. And um, so we have to take that into consideration. So, so essentially, to me, everybody's kind of working, you know, like everybody's working. All the good workers are working. Uh, and whoever applies for benefits for unemployment, they probably like want to take it a little slower on finding a job. They probably want to coast a little bit. Um, so, so essentially, employers right now are talking to people that are already working. So I think the big challenge is for 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 employers is to really put the best possible offer. Like they gotta know that that person has a job, and there's gotta be a reason why they should jump aboard and come to you. So it's gotta be you know a very attractive job offer, and a, a, that goes along with the benefit package and all the all the things that Melissa was mentioning. So. Um, Another challenge that I think uh, that I think that they're going to be facing is that, or it is currently happening, but job seeker and employer sometimes they don't know they exist. They're looking for somebody. They're looking to move or they're looking for a job, but they don't know they exist. So, uh, so, so I think that you know, with this whole social media and those this media landscape that's that it's this revolutionary times that we live in and with digital. Um, 
I think that's a big challenge for how do employers get in front of the right talent. Um, and, and let me add, let me interject here. What are you seeing employers do to get in front of more potential employees? That's the thing. I think a lot of them are doing very traditional stuff like Indeed. Indeed has a, in my personal humble opinion, a monopoly on this, on the job search engine. I think maybe people might agree with me. And um, they only expose the jobs if you put a big budget behind it. So a lot of people, a lot of employers are putting a lot of money into Indeed. And um, there's maybe there's other job search engines out there, but Indeed has a big handle on it. So, so um, I try to trick sometimes the system. I pretend I'm going to spend a lot of money and then for two days, and then there's a big, like the gates are open and then, uh, you know, I changed the budget. <laughs> So there's some tricks that you can do, but um, but I think employers, I believe, especially in Iowa, they're still doing some traditional stuff, and there's gotta be like very non-traditional approaches to get in front of in front of the talent that's already working right now because of the unemployment. Give me one non non-traditional approach. Podcasting, um, you know, tell your culture. Uh, in a long term, in a longer format where people can find you and expose your culture with, uh, you know, talking to your internal talent. Um, uh, it's, it, you know, employers, job seekers are looking for purpose and their next job has to mean something to them or at least the company and the services that they're going to go to. It feel like they people are looking for something meaningful. Uh, and if you give them a culture or if you showcase your culture uh, and uh, you know and, and and expose why you should be why you're a good employer, people are going to come to you. So podcasting could be a, a very newer way of of doing it. That's a good idea. Thank you, Joyce. Mm -hmm. Let's let's um, zero in on some some specific sectors. For the past few years, we've heard that it's been really hard to find uh, to fill job openings in the healthcare. Give me a little bit, tell us a little bit about that challenge and then what Unity Point's doing to fill those jobs and what are the hardest jobs to fill? Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy, for the invite to participate today in this great conversation. Um, Unity Point Health and healthcare in general, um, it has been quite challenging over the last couple of years. These are not new challenges. Um, the, but they certainly have worsened over the last few years. Um, we experienced a number of healthcare professionals leaving the industry as a result of the pandemic. However, we are starting to see a rebound. And I would tell you that um, the highest vacancies that we have, the most difficult to recruit, and this is based on number of vacancies and time to fill, um, haven't changed a lot. So I'm going to tell you RNs um, that there's been a shortage for years, um, medical lab scientists, um, behavioral health providers. <clears throat> so whether it's uh, physicians or advanced practice practitioners or therapists, um, sonographers, and then think about the direct caregivers like CNAs, patient care techs, those are our most difficult positions to fill and where we have the largest number of vacancies. So what are some of the things Unity Point's doing differently to fill those vacancies? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I, I certainly agree with the previous comments about really looking at non-traditional ways. Um, we're seeking out candidates that we want to work at Unity Point Health, no longer in a position where you can wait for someone to apply for your positions. Um, I think that's been a huge shift and probably the same in all industries. Um, with healthcare jobs on the rise, a 70% increase anticipated in the next 10 years, it is uh, it creates a unique situation where we really focus on, um, we've developed career pathway programs. So we're actually introducing to high school students and or current team members in positions that maybe require less than an associate's degree to actually come into our healthcare career pathway programs and we support them through school 
to then become a licensed or certified professional. So career pathway programs, our high school partnerships obviously are, are big for us. Targeted partnerships with educational institutions so that we're really building the um, graduates out of programs that have the highest need. And one other thing is huge and that is using technology to create a, a more, um, an environment that not only gains efficiencies, but allows healthcare providers to spend more time with our patients. And that's why we're here. Um, talk a little bit more about the career pathways. Are you seeing more students, high school students getting into those programs than maybe a few years ago? Yes, absolutely. And through the state of Iowa, the programs um, to begin to really those apprenticeship programs in the high schools. Um, there are many of those across the state of Iowa, which has been phenomenal. Um, and we actually are now hiring in the healthcare industry high school um, students that are 16 and 17 year olds uh, go back five years ago and hospitals rarely hired anyone under the age of 18. So we're adapting to make sure we're making room for more individuals that are entering the workforce or not currently working to just increase that pipeline. And then talk a little bit about the consequence, consequences of having healthcare facilities that aren't fully staffed. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty simple. It leads to high staff burnout which leads to then turnover and it's that vicious circle. Um, it leads to longer waits in our emergency departments, which then leads to less than an ideal patient experience. So it's, it's really that simple, Kathy. Okay, great, thank you. Samantha, sort of like healthcare, the building trades have a need for, for more workers. Briefly sort of tell us about the um, groups that the council represents and then talk about the areas of greatest need for workers. Mute. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for the invite. Um, so the council represents 16 area building trades unions representing over 15,000 skilled workers across central Iowa. We provide the workforce for hundreds of local contractors and contractors that work across the state, primarily training individuals through registered apprenticeship programs. Uh, we're seeing increased demand across the commercial and industrial construct and sex construction markets here in Iowa. There are billions of dollars of private sector investments in Iowa fueled in part by historic federal legislation coming out of the Biden administration for things like infrastructure and energy. So we're definitely seeing this increase in skilled trades um, deficits that folks have, have talked about. What are one or two of the main factors contributing to the need for more skilled tradesmen? So the first one I just mentioned, increased demand, right? Lots of investments out there, lots of dollars that are earmarked for projects, and we just need the people to be able to do them. But another huge concern is the age of our current construction workforce. Um, we're seeing lots of retirements right now. Uh, more than one in five construction workers are 55 or older. And these are some of the more experienced workers as well out in the field. And so that's something that's definitely a concern that we have to meet uh, the demand for in terms of replacing these workers. We're not right now at the speed at which they're retiring. What are some of the things the council's doing or the trade groups are doing to attract more workers that maybe you didn't do a few years ago? Things Sure. Didn't. So one um, was mentioned just previously, right, is working more with high schools and youth generally. Um, we have got to steer away from this prevailing narrative that going to college is superior to learning a trade. Um, learning a trade typically doesn't require a college degree, but many of our trades can offer comparable pay, if not more, than what college degree uh, earners are making. So uh, this starts with young people doing more with high schools to do apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship training, um, getting high school students exposed to the trades. Uh, we're also working to, to bring in more women in particular. You see, I have my Iowa Women in Trade shirt on. Um, women have been underrepresented in the construction industry, along with people of color. And these are really high quality jobs. And so there should be no one in our, in our communities that, that don't have access or be able to participate in these programs. We're really proud here in Iowa, our building trades union apprenticeships have 75% or more of the women or people of color who are in apprenticeship programs in construction across the state. 
um, making the construction trades more accessible for women in particular is a passion project of mine. A lot of our labor unions are coming out with maternity benefits and other protections that make it easier for especially working moms to join our industry. And lastly, promoting labor protection. So it's really hard to recruit people into the construction industry if there's folks that think that it's not a safe occupation or that you know there's a lot of misclassification and other problems in the industry that we have to combat if we're gonna have people be able to enjoy good careers um, in construction. And like I asked Joyce, sort of what's at stake if we don't have people, if we don't have enough trades people? Sure. Well, everyone knows that blue collar workers are essential, right? Um, it's hard to imagine not having someone available to fix your central air. And we are really in a position in the coming decades where if we don't do something about our workforce, you know, you folks could have to wait weeks or even months to get repairs done in, in commercial and industrial settings. So the shortage is definitely cause for concern. Lots of money investments out there waiting um, in terms of upgrades to bridges, roads, broadband, electric vehicle charging stations water, energy systems. So we want to make sure that we rise to the to the moment so that these great projects can happen, but it requires people. Thanks, Samantha. So Kathy, um, in August 2019, Iowa had 1,748,700 people in its workforce. In August, we sh the, the state data showed that that had dropped by nearly 65,000 people. So we have 65,000 fewer people in the workforce now. Who's left and what is the state doing to help employers find those employees? Thank you, Kathy. And also thank you to the whole business record team uh, for the invitation to join this conversation. I think it's an important one and um, it's a pleasure to be a part of it. Um, just based on your question, over the last four to five months, the most frequent, the frequent reason we hear respondents sharing for being out of the labor force is typically due to retirements, just like Samantha mentioned. Um, one out of every four employers has concerns about the retirements, and there's a pretty good reason for that. Um, I was an older state. Um, so the upper Midwest, the Great Lakes, North re uh, Northeast regions all have high percentages of populations over the age of 65. Um, in Iowa, that portion of demographic is increasing. Younger population groups are just for the most part flat or declining in our area. Uh, so there, there's some concern about that, but that is definitely the population um, that we've seen uh, exiting the, the workforce. So you also asked a little bit about, you know, what is the state doing about mm -hmm. it specifically? And one of the things we're doing is try to connect uh, employers to those uh, pockets of untapped labor force um, and giving folks the opportunities to re-enter the labor market. Um, one of the ways the state has done that is through creation of the business engagement division. Um, we're also realigning uh, statewide workforce programs into Iowa workforce development, basically to make it easier for employers to find the kind of uh, resources um, that can be helpful to them as to attract team members or retain team members. Um, the state is also investing heavily into increasing work-based learning and apprenticeship opportunities. You've heard apprenticeship uh, already mentioned, as well as Unity Point mentioning the kind of the high school uh, talent uh, talent pool that I think you'll see uh, increased efforts in that. Um, and then the other thing that I'll share is just uh, increasing opportunities for those with disabilities to connect with employment. Um, that is probably the largest untapped talent pool in our state. Um, and so we are making some efforts to help connect the dots there uh, for employers to find the, that, that labor force. Can you dive a little deeper into that part, into the disabled, getting more disabled people into the workforce? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the areas that we've expanded within the business engagement division within Iowa Workforce Development is our Disability Engagement Bureau. So we have three people dedicated across the state, primarily to and help employers, either through culture or their workplace, their physical workplace, um, offer additional opportunities for those with disabilities. So sometimes that's addressing uh, a physical workspace issue. Other times that's um, helping employers to consider, uh, you know, populations that they never considered before. Um, one really great example of that is in Centerville. Uh, there is a company where they are hiring an increasing number of individuals with autism. 
And what they've done is be able to kind of reshape part of their manufacturing floor to eliminate some additional distractions. Um, and that's made it easier, easier for them to hire those with autism uh, to be able to work in their facility. It's it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting ground. And I think uh, in Iowa, we're going to see just over the next five years, I think we're going to see that increase. Great, great. Can you talk a little, we've heard about the need for more healthcare workers and skilled tradespeople. What are some of the other areas of need in Iowa? You know, the one that I would share that um, those are absolutely, you know, the two that are probably really well known. Um, but I would I would also say, I don't know if all of your attendees today would would know that education is probably in one of those fields as well. Um, that is a pocket where uh, more districts are having uh, issues hiring, especially the more rural districts, you know, they're they're having to be more creative in hiring anything from teachers to bus drivers to cafeteria workers. Um, the one thing that I would share that I, I think is pretty exciting too is Governor Reynolds a couple of years ago came up with an idea to um, to really use apprenticeship as a model to develop uh, a, a larger pipeline of workers within education. Uh, so we call that our TPA TPRA program, um, but it's been really successful. And so far, um, the number of uh, participants that have registered through that have been over a thousand. Uh, the number of districts participating is 123, um, and so far there are 90 completions. That means 55 K through 12 teachers are now in the workforce because of this uh, unique apprenticeship model, and 35 teacher aides are. Very cool. Very cool. Um, thank you, Kathy. Tom, let's turn our focus to the manufacturing sector. So far this year, there's been 4,300 layoff notices in manufacturing. And in 2023, there was almost 900, and the year before that, 970s. Talk a little bit about what's causing these layoffs. And since this is a discussion about jobs outlook, what's in store for manufacturing in 2025? Thanks, Kathy, and thanks for having me today. Uh, manufacturing absolutely is a, a critical part when we think about the Iowa economy. Um, you're right on the money. Over the last year, the manufacturing number of employment has dropped by 1% for Iowa, where we've actually have increased the labor force and the number employed overall by 1.3 statewide. Um, when you think about manufacturing, we've been hurt a lot by um, the higher interest rate environment, hurting some things like agriculture and, and the production. And we think about agriculture and John Deere layoffs and things like that. Um, and that is a big part of our manufacturing sector. Um, looking forward, it's not a great outlook when you think about manufacturing going forward. Um, as you know, Creighton does a kind of a manufacturing slash uh, Midwest um, outlook where they survey manufacturers and producers. And for Iowa, they split it out by state. The new orders index for September was um, one of the lowest levels it's been for the last year, down at 40 on a scale of um, 100, above 50 is expansion. Um, it's been below expansion for the last few months in terms of looking forward for manufacturing. So I think that manufacturing is going to continue to be a problem in terms of us. We're going to have a slowdown, and that is creating a little bit of a drag for us um, relative to the rest of the economy. So briefly explain sort of what the importance of manufacturing and manufacturing jobs is to Iowa's mm -hmm. economy. Absolutely. When you think about manufacturing, it is... Um, Right at about 14% of the jobs um, are in manufacturing, but that's actually small relative to its impact on GDP. For output for um, Iowa, it's about 18% of output in the manufacturing sector. So a little bit smaller in terms of the number of jobs, but its impact overall broadly on our ability to produce goods is a little bit greater than the number of jobs. Um, that makes it one of the largest sectors, depending on how you break it out in terms of the economy. Um, trade, transportation, and utilities combined is about the same size um, as, as a manufacturing sector in GDP, um, but it's a little bit larger in the number of employed. And that's a pretty broad category. That includes retail and wholesale trade and transportation. There's a lot of things in that category compared to the manufacturing side. Um, so it is a significant portion of the economy when you think about the impact it has. Um, overall. Thanks, Tom. So, Amner, talk a little bit about if we're seeing uh, manufacturing workers being laid off or losing their jobs, are those skills transferable to other type, other sectors? And what are you seeing happening there? Mute. 
There we go. Yes. Um, yeah, so Tyson closed in Perry. Um, I grew up in Perry, Iowa. I landed in Perry in 1995 and and uh, sat to hear the plant close. But, you know, the uh, the a lot of people, you know, the impact wasn't as as uh, uh, catastrophic as everybody thought it was going to be. A lot of a lot of employers came. Uh, the town organized well, and uh, there was several job fairs with over 5,000 jobs uh, that uh, people were able to have in front of them. So I haven't heard any sad stories or anything like that, and I have a lot of connections in Perry. So um, I think it's important to 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 point out the importance of immigration um, between nine, 2014 to 2020 to 21 even, or even 22, I would drive down all the uh, sectors of warehouses, you know, those uh, industrial sectors, hiring, 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 McDonald's, Burger King, everybody was hiring. Now, if you drive down those sectors, which I just did a, about a week ago, very scattered hiring signs, now hiring signs. So, Again, my boss and I uh, used to talk about, you know, there was desperate times for manufacturing that they couldn't find the right people to do the job. There's some jobs that only certain people are willing to take on. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because the narrative is so upside down. Um, Iowa needs immigration. Um, in order to to continue to be uh, 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 you know healthy in the workforce. So, as far as what I see in the future, you know, I'm lately in the last three months, I have heard that some staffing agencies are closing or selling or closing some branches here in the in Des Moines. So we as a staffing agency had to pivot and be more of a recruiting, more of a headhunting firm, more hard to find roles. So I foresee the manufacturing, uh, my my opinion uh, uh, is that it's probably going to stay the same way that a lot of employers that needed us five, four, five, six years ago or three years ago or two years ago, they don't need us that much anymore. And that's because, you know, the the the, the need has been that there's jobs, there's people to fill those jobs. Uh, so now if you look at Indeed and, you know, job search engines, it's more like uh, technical jobs, more um, HVAC and electrical and a little bit higher skilled than a, you know, just a general laborer. So um, at least that's my opinion. Okay, thanks. Um, Samantha, are the trades someplace people who have been laid off from manufacturing or have had manufacturing skills? Is that someplace they can go? And are the trades reaching out to some of these folks? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we participate in some of the Perry activities and certainly think that some of these jobs are, are transferable, not only because of the type of work involved, you know, physical labor or, or using your hands, but also a lot of folks in these manufacturing settings, many of them are unionized. They're good. They're, they're used to having higher pay and higher benefits given um, the type of job, meaning not necessarily one requiring a college degree. And so that's pretty transferable to the building trades as far as being able to get the same Kind of retirement and health and, and pay benefits, um, but again, without that specialized education. So um, I did see there was a question in the chat about um, talking to folks about salary and benefits and stuff. A lot of folks coming out of manufacturing do understand the importance of benefits. And so that's one thing that's a natural draw for us to get folks from uh, those other industries is the importance of health care and, and pension. And the same thing with folks who are, you know, having legal status to be able to work in the country. Um, you know, we see a lot of, of immigrant communities uh, in manufacturing. And so, you know, for them to be able to come to the building trades, we have plenty of, of Spanish speaking um, folks who can help them transition into our workforce too. So we've seen positive results from those um, types of efforts. Great. I'm going to pivot just a little bit. We have a question about how industries are just industries are adjusting to the recruitment of new college grads who value a, a salary or hourly wage more than the healthcare benefits because they can stay on their parents until age 26. I'm just going to throw it open to the panel. Anybody want to tackle that question? Please. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I can I'll speak slightly to it. When we look at our new college graduates leaving Drake and, and the recruitment process, they see um, salary is important. You're right on the, on the money for that. 
Um, but I think a lot of them are looking for unique opportunities as much also. Um, you're right, they probably dis decrease the amount of benefits, but they're looking for things that they find rewarding. Um, it's not just come and do a, a function and, and, you know, earn a check and leave. They're looking for things that are um, more meaningful. So it's trying to give them reasons and ways to expand their knowledge base and ways to feel um, tied into maybe the bigger picture of what you're doing than just completing the function that is, is really the thing that attracts our, our students as they're graduating and they're comparing across different different offers. Um, I don't think it is, salary is important, absolutely, but I think those extra things in terms of the work outside of benefits um, are, are key. Okay, thanks, Tom. Anybody else? I'll just Kathy, add, I would, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry about that. Um, I would just add uh, flexibility. I think flexibility is the one thing that that we're, our employers are, are talking to us about, and um, I think even flexibility, whether it's in the shift or the location or, you know, in, in just about every conceivable way, I think flexibility is one key to overcome that. Okay, and Joyce? I would add to what um, Tom was saying about the, the experience and the exposure and the opportunity to do many different things, even within one employer, right? And the same can be said for many industries, but that is critically important. Um, that's what the younger generations are looking for, are many different experiences and growing and developing um, within their own person and within an organization. Right, thanks. So Melissa, sort of what skills are employers looking for in potential employees and what skills do we see lacking out there? Yeah, great question. I'm going to focus on uh, soft skills. I certainly think Samantha, Joyce, everybody's mentioned some of the, you know, the skilled trades and healthcare and things like that. So we often get asked more than ever, actually, from the employers that we serve just about soft skills. How do I find soft skills training? Uh, for my employees. And what I mean by that, I mean emotional intelligence, social awareness, uh, all those different self-awareness aspects. And so there seems to be a growing gap in that, at least from the employers that we serve perspective. And so we see more organizations asking to find different options to train their teams, certainly on management, leadership experience with that growing gap. Some people talked about retirements. There's this growing gap of leaders and leadership skills, so to speak. And so all of that plays a role. So those are a lot of what we hear um, getting asked about in terms of uh, training and skills. Thank you. And then sort of are employers willing to train workers for, the, for those things? You know, I... I yeah, I've seen more willingness than ever on that front just to invest more dollars, the recognition that it's a win-win. Employees really want to be developed. They want to be trained. They're hungry for it, even in experiences. And so the company wins when they can retain and develop and make a stronger employee, but then also the employee wins because they feel that development and are getting that development. So yeah, we see more willingness than ever for that investment to um, put money into training. So we've talked about the need for Iowa to have more workers. Tom, talk a little bit about some ways the state can grow its workforce. And then I want everybody else, if you have an answer, to pipe in too. Yeah, that's a great question, Kathy. Um, when you think about, first off, the need, let's talk about that to start with. Um, one of the things coming out of the pandemic um, is we had actually this, this, if you look at the ratio of number of unemployed to job openings, um, we actually were down to about 0.5 or a little bit below in Iowa, which would mean we actually had two openings for every person looking for a job. Um, that started to reverse. Um, nationally, it's back up to 0.9, so we're almost an opening for every person. Iowa is a little bit below that, 0.7, so we still have a shortage of workers. And I think that that is something that we are struggling with, and, and that's a demographic challenge um, that we struggle with. It has to do with retirements that were mentioned earlier. It has to do with people leaving the workforce that are um, wanting to do that and transition out sooner. And it has to do with people also leaving the state. When we think about our young um, people who are graduating college and graduating high school and looking for opportunities, so they want to stay in Iowa or not. I, I think that the key on, on the workforce as we go forward is providing those opportunities and living spaces and unique ideas that attract everybody. Um, regardless of what it is. And when I think about small rural communities who are doing well, 
They're the ones who are really working hard in a community basis, trying to bring in things that are attractive, whether it be opportunities for um, health care or opportunities for child care or something like that, where the community is actually banding together and trying to bring things in that promote that sense of family and sense of place. The, the other thing I think is huge is something that um, Amner mentioned in terms of immigration. Um, we have a problem as a nation. Uh, we have a slowing birth rate. And one of the things that gives us a large growth, we always think of economic growth as being fostered by three things, um, productivity, obviously, but workers and the amount of capital invested. We have to have a growing workforce overall, and immigration is huge to helping us provide that. Um, and I know that's a politically charged uh, discussion right now, but um, there has to be ways that we have a growth in the workforce overall and the growth in population. Otherwise, we grow slower as a state and slower as. Okay, thanks. Anybody else care to chime in? Go ahead, Amner. Yes, I'd like to just. Uh, uh... So it's attraction. So we're talking about how do we attract them uh, uh, or keep uh, uh, people here in the state. And I think I think the state needs to have a really honest conversation with its business community, and uh, and and realize that the age, you know, Iowa, as as it was mentioned earlier, uh, age wise is getting older, and uh, you need to attract younger people. And younger people want to be entertained. They want to be in 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 places where uh there's things to do uh so i think there's got to be an investment uh uh from the state on the entertainment side um and also i believe that it it being a welcoming uh place is also going to be important um people will move out of state if 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 the state doesn't feel uh like it is a welcoming place and it that's why a lot of people that graduate they move out of state um and there's a lot of uh people you know with all these you know weather things happening migration is a natural thing people move out of move because of uh you know poverty weather wars you know right we don't have wars here but like it'll happen no matter what so if the state is not ready to be welcoming it, people are going to also uh, um you know, not stay and move move on to another place. So for all of you, sort of what's at stake if the state continues to have this gap between the supply of workers and demand for them? Melissa, you wanna take a stab at that? Unmute. There we go. Um, I, I think it affects us all in all the ways that we are used to receiving services. And as Samantha mentioned, just even, you know, I know we've struggled here to get a plumber to come and fix our sink as an example, um, had long waits for that. So I think it's going to touch not just our businesses, but the way that we are used to receiving meals, the way we're re used to receiving services, all of those different aspects will continue to suffer if we don't innovate, if we don't uh, find ways to fill the shortages that are happening and continue to happen. Anybody else? You know, I'll, I'll continue with a comment that I made before, and I'm my entire career has been in healthcare, and so I I made a comment about it's as simple as longer waits in the emergency department. Um, why? Uh, because with the shortage, beds are closed, so inpatient beds are closed. And not to be flippant, but in healthcare, if if we don't continue to increase and build new pipelines, um, it's people's lives at stake because they either will not go to the emergency room um, for care or to their physician because they can't get in, um, and people will die. And I don't mean to be flippant, but it's the reality. And then Joyce, I want to stay with you. Talk a little bit about what Unity Point is doing to attract more healthcare workers in Iowa's small communities. Yes, um, absolutely. So we actually have very robust physician residency programs. Um, at Unity Point Health, we start 148 uh, physician residents through programs every year in eight different residency programs. And of those that um, complete those programs, and it's rare that, that physicians 
the residents don't finish their programs. 75% stay in Iowa to practice. So that is very critical to um, the state and the care. Um, the other thing in the rural communities, in our small communities, the partnerships that we have with the small community hospitals is critical, um, not only for patients to come to, you know, to Des Moines for care, or to a larger community for care. We want patients going back there, right? And we rely on those small community hospitals to then care for patients in their own community. Um, think about telemedicine and virtual care. Another way that we're opening up additional services and care within those communities and those communities we're helping. They are leaning heavily into the high school programs to actually build their own workforce within the communities. Many of them stay within the community. And then we always look for the boomerang, right? The, the population that leaves Iowa and stay in contact because oftentimes they reach a point when they're ready to come back home. Great, thank you. And Kathy, you've mentioned the business engagement di division. Give us a little, tell us a little bit about that and then sort of, I know it's been in place for about two years. What, what are some of the impacts the divisions had? Sure. Um, well, and this, I think it's a lot of fun to talk about this division. So Governor Reynolds, uh, this was her idea way back even before January of 2022. As she was visiting visiting employers across the state, one of the things that she heard frequently was um, employers really not knowing if they'd heard about a program, maybe how to access it or if it applied to them, um, not, not understanding the resources that were available to them, or in some situations, employers having somebody reach out to them literally every single day, a different either area of workforce or uh, offering a different workforce program and, and kind of being inundated. And so this division was really formed at Governor Reynolds' idea and, the, and what we do and what the reason that we were formed is really to be that employer guide through a lot of the resources and programs that are available and even connecting employers to best practices with other employers. Um, so that was the idea. And so what we've done over the last two years is one, develop a team of uh, one team of 16 that is located across the state, each available to help the employers in their area access those resources, programs, grants, understand what's available to them from an, as an employer um, in the whole workforce equation. So that's been exciting. But in the time since then, uh, with government realignment, I think most of you probably have heard about that. Um, we really also shaped where are all the programs within the state and can we align programs and help um, deliver even better service um, by, you know, putting programs where they make sense, maybe not where they were created 40 years ago. And so that effort has really made a big difference, particularly I'll share an example of how we work with uh, Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services. Um, so in January of 2022, IVRS and Iowa Workforce were completely separate divisions. Um, now that we're aligning, working much more closely together, we do have a division I mentioned, which is the disability engagement team, um, also within business engagement, that now helps employers at that next specialized level, um, you know, more than just broad resources and programs. But now we're able to help employers um, on things like disability engagement or apprenticeship. The apprenticeship division is within business engagement. Increase apprenticeships, increase work-based learning opportunities. Um, I, I'm hoping that within five years, most employers, you know, we're not there yet, but I, I really do feel like most employers should know that one person that they can go to if they have a question about workforce. Great. Thank you. And we're going to do one quick round robin question. So um, I mean, each of you, can you tell me one thing employers can do to retain the workforce they have? And Melissa, let's start with you. There's so many things. So I'm <laughs> going to just <laughs> reference. I read a book in the last year or two called Prime to Perform. Highly recommend it. It's by Dashi and McGregor. It talks about internal motivation. So pay is table stakes. And we've all been talking about that. It's how do you tap into play, purpose, and potential? And it goes through lots of great, very practical, tactical ways that you can do that. Um, and it just changed my paradigm completely about really how to tap into that internal motivation and really help 
uh, your employees, your team, maybe even yourself, live your best days, work your best days, and really things start to work from there. So retention to me is a lot about culture and a lot about how you tap into that uh, play purpose and potential. Great. Thanks. Joyce? Culture. Culture is it. Um, make sure that we continue across Iowa to build diversity in our workforces and make sure that we're providing a welcoming environment to all. Thank you. Amner? Uh, yes, I'll uh, second the Joyce culture and then diversify. Diversify, diversify, diversify. The demographics are changing. It's inevitable. And you know, if you don't diversify, if if I find myself with an employer and I'm the only one, I don't just want like, you know, tacos or, you know, it's not just about the outside. It's like, I need to see people that look like me and then I'll stay with the, that employer. Right. Samantha? Take care of your people. Um, pay is important, benefits and play by the rules. Lots of employers do not play by the rules and that's going to be important if you want to keep people. Tom? You know, I think all these good ideas, I, I'm going to go back to the culture. And, and when I say culture, I, I think you've hit on a lot of good ones, but I also think it is about a rewarding experience for the employee. Um, and by rewarding, that means things outside of benefits and outside of salary. It's coming to work and having a, a day that you enjoy being there and you feel like you're accomplishing something and feel like you're a valued member of the, the team that you're working on. Great. And then Kathy? Sure, I think all of those sound great. Um, the, the one thing that I'd add is most assume that retention strategies need to be expensive, but that's not always the case. If I were an employer, I'd maybe start with asking the top talent what matters most to them and then listening. Um, what matters to one might not what might be very different than what matters to another. Um, flexibility is one thing that we're hearing a lot from our employers, those who have the top retention. Uh, there's an example, Country Made in Northwest Iowa, um, their their level of flexibility, especially for a manufacturer, is is truly, I mean, they're, they're among the top of the game. Um, and so that flexibility might mean work hours, it might be work location, it might be adding weekend shift to help alleviate some workforce or some childcare struggles in the area. So, um, you know, I just think asking the questions and, and really listening might be might be a really key way uh, to strengthen retention. Great. This has been a really good discussion and I've walked away, coming away with some story ideas. Um, so thank you. We're about out of time. So we're gonna go around one more time and just each of you share your final takeaway on the jobs outlook for 2025. And Tom, I'm gonna start with you this time. Great, thanks, Kathy. Um, jobs outlook for 2025, I, I think we are in an interesting spot as in, in the broad economy. Um, and what I mean by that is assuming we, we don't slide and, and slow down in, in terms of overall economic growth, I think we're still gonna be relatively strong. I think our biggest challenge as a state um, comes back to that that mix and places that we're struggling on. And, and manufacturing is brought up as, as one of the big struggles for us right now. Okay, thanks. And Amner. Unmute. There we go. I'll I'll uh, pass this one for now. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Melissa. Yeah, I think jobs outlook is, you know, what I would do is and what I hear from employers is focus on that experience, focus on that culture, focus on what you need to do to be a great place to work, to be a top place to work. And a lot falls in line after that. It doesn't it have to be expensive. I agree with Kathy. People want to hear that you care. They want you to listen and they want you to take action. And so I think really it's as simple as that because it's not going to get any easier. The jobs outlook is the shortages will continue and the skill gap will continue. So really focusing in on what you can do uh, is, is going to be important. Um, Kathy. Sure. I would just say, you know, really for employers to reach out to the resources that are available to them. I mean, our business engagement consultant is one resource. But everybody on this call is also an incredible resource, and I'm guessing that there are employers who have been through what they're going through, whether that is um, struggling to hire, struggling to retain. Maybe that's not their issue. Maybe they're going through a downturn and they want to uh, retain as many workers as they possibly can and utilize programs for that or find out how other companies uh, navigated those similar issues. If I were to leave employers with one thing, I would just say there are resources out there make those connections and tap into those. And that, that can be really helpful. 
Thank you. And then Joyce, I think we might have lost Samantha, but go ahead, Joyce. <clears throat> Just continue to um, reflect on how, as employers, we we need to change and we need to adapt rather than assuming that the workers always need to adapt to what the business needs are. We, we've we got to get better and better at that. Thank you. Chris, back to you. Unmute, Chris. You'd think I'd get that by now, but thank you, Kathy, and thank you, panelists, for your expertise today and helping us look ahead to 2025. Before we go today, a couple things that are coming up. Our Envision Iowa event I mentioned uh, earlier today on October 22nd, uh, we'd love to have you there. We're going to be talking about a lot of these topics today, but really looking at some of the macro issues around that. You can register on our website. And then our Power Breakfast, we're going to be, again, hitting on the same topic in a different type of way. We're going to be talking about the Malta General uh, multi-generational workforce. We've got a great panel of, uh, of workers and, and leaders from each of the different generations. Uh, we're talking about it as a battle of the generations. Hopefully it won't really be a battle, but uh, the idea there is for us to take a little bit of a look at what's coming ahead uh, as you're looking to navigate your, your uh, workplace and your environment and making sure that you've got a great culture in place as well. And then on October 30th, we've got our fearless annual celebration. Great opportunity for you to connect with our women of influence and other mentors from across the state as well. If you have story ideas, any feedback on today, please reach out Kathy's way. As you heard her say, she got a number of great story ideas. I know she's going to be continuing to address those in our coverage going forward this year and into next year. Uh, and again, I want to thank everybody for attending. We too are a locally owned business. We're working hard to, to always make sure we're providing the great things for you and your business so that you've got the resources and tools to position yourself well to have success in the future. Sponsorships and advertising help make these programs free and available to, to our audience. So thank you again to our supporting sponsor, IEDA, and to our HR Pro of the Year sponsor, Dentons Davis Brown, for making today possible. And of course, again, a final congrats to Jeff Votes, this year's HR Pro of the Year. Thank you again to our panelists for your expertise today. Uh, we really appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. If I or the team at the Business Record can ever be of any help to you uh, or uh, uh, your business, please feel free to reach out our way and we'll be happy to help. Thank you. Have a great afternoon and we'll see you soon.